What a great intro, and all because I gave you a winner that paid seven dollars and eighty cents last year. <laughs> I hope you didn't spend it all in one place. But I'm, I'm trying to think how many times since I have been here that I've been able to uh, to celebrate success from the year before. You know, I, I know. <laughs> I got one more. I got one more. Uh, I, I did pick Street Sense, who paid a hefty eleven dollars uh, back uh, back in 2007. You know, before that's a little murkier, but uh, I, no, I freely admit that you know my, it was a long time between drinks on, on Derby winners for me. But after I finally got Street Sense home, uh, you know, I did the count back, and actually I, I knew exactly what the count was, <laughs> how long it had been since I'd picked a Derby winner publicly. And it was a lovely horse named Ferdinand who paid forty-four dollars to win, uh, and that was uh, 1986. So it was a little, <laughs> little stretch in between there, but you know, you do the math, which we race trackers do. We can, uh, we can look at any TV and start figuring by increments anywhere from 20 cents to $2. If you had wagered $2 on every derby since I publicly uh, gave out Ferdinand, that you would have hit exactly your last $2 in 2007. <laughs> where it would have carried you a little bit ahead and then you were down. But uh, what, what an amazing year it was last year. It's great to be back with all of you. It, it staggers me how quickly it comes. I always tell people that when we get to a uh, hundred days uh, till Derby in my place. It's it's like it's tomorrow, uh, but it really accelerated uh, this year, and it is almost tomorrow. We're right about there. Today is Thurby. Happy Thurby to everybody. We're uh, celebrating at our track today with that uh, that new holiday continues to grow. We had a record crowd for Thursday of Derby Week last year on, on Thurby of more than thirty thousand. There was a good group out there today. As I was uh, trying to get off the premises and get down here on time, which I must pat myself on the back. I was remarkably early today. Charlie Overs should have been here. He keeled over because I got here early. But uh, but uh, but it's uh, it, it's a good day, and and, uh, and of course we hit Oaks Day tomorrow. Coming off incredible years, uh, the uh, an incredible year I should say, Kentucky Oaks last year, which was you know Louisville's little day at the races as recently as, as 1990. That's when we finally opened the infield. 1989 we had fewer than 50,000 there at the Kentucky Oaks, and last year the crowd was nearly 125,000. By far a record for the Kentucky Oaks, and the Derby surpassed the 170,000 mark for the first time last year. And it was a good day for it, as we had a remarkable winner of the race, who, as we've mentioned already, withstood my pick in the run for the Roses, because I've uh, I've stopped a few good ones over my time, but American Pharaoh got the job done. Although, and I think this is the most remarkable thing about a remarkable horse, that I believe he won the Kentucky Derby, that he he was in the spotlight as expected on the biggest day of his life and did it with an effort that was really subpar. You cannot imagine a championship event where you're going to win it when you're not on your best day, whether it's an individual sport or a team sport. But American Pharaoh, I'm telling you, was not his A game we saw on Derby Day last year. Might not have been his B game. We saw that all year long. But on Derby Day, it was a struggle. Things were not normal on Derby Day for American Pharaoh, which is fitting because it's not normal for anybody on Kentucky Derby Day. You're facing, uh, as he did last year, 170,000 people. You've got all these horses on the track. You've never gone this far. It's a mile and a quarter. All the sensations leading up to it, which he handled perfectly all through the week. As we say in racing, he never turned a hair at any point. He was just super cool. And, and one of the things that really sets him apart is that he is a horse that loves people. I mean, being around people is an amazing thing. He would if he, we had him in a room, he'd go up and nuzzle each one of you and steal a peppermint or two. And if he had a little tiny carrot, that would be a good thing for him. He loved those. But Derby Day was different. As he came over to, uh, uh, to the track on Derby Day, coming over to be saddled for the Derby, again, this was a horse that was unflappable. When you watched him in the morning, he did everything perfectly. Things you don't realize about American Pharaoh. And, you know, he was, you look at him, he's a good-looking horse. But, that, you know, he wasn't good-looking enough that he was sold at auction as a as a yearling, his owner, Ahmed Zaya, tried to sell him, and he didn't reach the reserve. I think he had a 500000 reserve on him, and he only brought three, so he took him home. Uh, lucky Mr. Zaya. <laughs> it was the best thing that ever happened to him. Uh, but but he, you know, he really matured, but still, when you, when you think of the, the great, incredible-looking athletes that have run in the Kentucky Derby, you think of Secretariat, first and, first and foremost. Um, you know, Secretary, I used to, I'm going to have to change my reference here sometime. I used to call him Schwarzenegger in horseshoes, but I'm not sure that works anymore. Uh, you, you know, I don't know, maybe the rock. I mean, so, somebody who's, a, who's just an incredible physical specimen, that was Secretary. I mean, he, he stood out in any crowd. His, his, his coat just shined, and, and, uh, and he just had the physical tools. As, as I've told the, many of you over the years, that, uh, you know, he had, he had the big ticker. You know, and when he died, they did an autopsy, and his, 
his heart was four times larger than the average equine, equine heart. And it was not because it was diseased or anything. He, was, he just had a bigger engine. He'd be, he'd be illegal in NASCAR. I mean, he was that kind of, he was that kind of athlete. And, and, and again, just look the part. American Pharaoh, much different racehorse, very sleek. Uh, but one amazing, one thing I always found amazing, it was fun to watch him get across the racetrack in the mornings. I remember last year, right before the Belmont Stakes, the third leg of the Triple Crown, uh, trainer Carl Nasker, who's won two Kentucky Derby winners and survived my pick with uh, Street Sense back in 2007. We were watching him go by, and, and he passes by us on the back stretch. And I look at Carl, and he looks at me, and he says, he said, it looks like he just jumps up in the ground, uh, jumps up in the air, and the ground moves underneath it. <laughs> That's the kind of motion he had. It was so perfect. And actually, his, his stride from, from, from the edge of the, of, of the lead hoof to the back was actually a bit longer than Secretariat. See, he was deceptive in, in, that, in that motion, but he had a, a, just this, this, this kind of this sleek, ground-eating stride. And, but on Derby Day, it was a different thing. He came around the first turn, that romantic moment that, that, that I've talked about so much here, the walkover where everybody comes over with their horses about 40, 45 minutes before post time. And it's a really magical moment. I think it's the most magical moment of Derby Day. If I could really feel what it would be like to, to be in the shoes of the owners and trainers uh, on, at any moment on that day, sure, the, the win's an easy thing to think about, but I love the walkover because everything is possible there. You've got 27,000 three-year-olds. It must be the case with this, the 20 under this year. 27,000 is three-year-old crop whittled down to a maximum of 20 on Kentucky Derby Day. And you're coming around, you look up at the spires, they're so close you can reach out and hug them. And everything is possible. People are screaming your name, and it's just an incredible incredibly wonderful moment of great optimism that is going to come crashing down in about 40 minutes for everybody except one. The, the winner is the, uh, it's going to be a joyous moment and for everyone else, at least momentarily, it's going to be the worst day of your lives. And it, it, it was almost that experience for American Pharaoh because this unflappable horse, this horse that never, it, it, there was never a moment where he was bothered by anything as he's walking around the derby crowd, 170,000 plus, got to him. He started jumping around, he went up on his back legs, something he'd never done before, and he's wasting that energy. Remember, there are no pit stops in the Kentucky Derby. That's essential to always remember. If you waste any energy at any point on the day, no matter how much you may have in the tank, you don't find a way to get it back later on. And that was Bob Baffert's big worries. He watched this horse do things he'd never done before, got him in the paddock, finally calmed him down a bit, sent him out on the track for the call to the post, and. And, uh, and, and, and the parade to the gate, and, and he calmed down by that point, breaking from an outside post. He came out of the gate, head of the stretch at Churchill, broke smartly, he, he was third in the early going. Uh, he had a stable mate, uh, Dortmund, on the lead, and another horse named Firing Line in between them, and actually that's the way the race ran. There were three horses all the way around, and uh, nobody else gained much ground in that particular derby, Very, really unusual derby. But when Baffert was looking on the back stretch, and watching his horses, he looked. He looked at Dortmund. He looked at American Pharaoh, and he thought to himself, "I'm going to win a Kentucky Derby." But he thought he was going to win it with Dortmund because he was just, you know, rolling on that lead. And American Pharaoh was going nowhere fast. He was he was in third. He was in a prominent position, but he was spinning his wheels. He could see Victor Espinosa, the jockey, scrubbing on him, trying to wake him up. And and then Victor said after the race, he said, "With a half mile to go, the half mile pole just going into the far turn." He said, "I had no horse." There was nothing there. He was giving me nothing. So he just kept working on him, trying to urge him forward. Finally swings him far to the outside. And if you go to the Derby Museum anytime soon or just go to YouTube and look at last year's race, you, you, you look at the horses when they turn for home and American Pharaoh is trying to make a move. Got Dortmund on the inside, firing line in between them. But American Pharaoh is way out in the racetrack. And that's because, uh, that's because his rider took him out there just trying to get him away from horses and get him focused. He also urged him in other ways. He did go to the stick, uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm trying to think how many times it was. This is a horse that got touched once with a whip at the, in the Preakness and the Belmont Stakes, but he felt a few more on Derby Day, just trying to wake him up. And finally, he started grinding it out. And in the middle of the stretch, he started moving and and got there and he got it done and won the race just as he was expected to do. But it was an extraordinarily difficult thing for American Pharaoh. And the, Baffert said after the race, they asked him about the Preakness, Triple Crown. He said, we'll see. We don't know. This was a tough race. And it wasn't until about Thursday or Friday after Derby that uh, the, the horse bounced back. And they said, let's go. And, and we made history. But the Derby was by far, as much as I love the other races and everything else that happened, the Derby was by far the most uh, difficult of those races, which, which is history. You look back over the great horses that have run in the Derby and, and didn't get the job done on Derby Day. And, 
It's, a, it's an extraordinary thing to win this race on the first Saturday in May at Churchill Downs. And as brilliant as he was, you know, the Sports Illustrated cover boy and, 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 and everything that, that went his direction the rest of the year, it would have been just another year if he had not won the Kentucky Derby. But the fact that this horse showed he had incredible heart and determination and, and went to the bottom of the well on his, on, his, on, his, on his worst day of the year, at least competitively, and got the job done over the best three-year-olds in the country, it was a really, really remarkable thing. So he was an incredible athlete. And there were two other things I loved about him, too. Uh, but one other thing is, is, is just what he meant to people and, and how many new people he brought to racing. And, 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 re and remember, too, it had been 37 years between Triple Crowns. A lot of people thought there was no chance that there would be another Triple Crown winner. They said, you need to shorten the races. You need to cut the Derby to a mile and an eighth. You need to stretch them out. Uh, you, you need to, if a horse doesn't run in the Derby, you should, you should ban them from the rest of the races. You don't need these fresh horses coming in. There are all kinds of possibilities, and I listened to all of them for years and told people that, uh, you know, when, when the right horse comes, it, it'll work. When the right horse, horse comes, we'll get it done. And, and he did. And I, one of my favorite uh, images of last year was following the Belmont Stakes. I don't know how many of you have seen this, but the cover of the Sports Illustrated following the Triple Crown win, the sweep by by American Pharaoh was just amazing because the photographer, and I wish I knew his name, but the photographer was trying to get to the home stretch to get a shot of the horse coming down there, and he, and he couldn't get to it. So he was actually several rows back, so he just did the best he could, stood back there, stuck the camera up above his head, and took a snapshot of, of American Pharaoh in the distance going by the, going by the finish line. What he also got was the cover shot on Sports Illustrated, which showed American Pharaoh off in the distance with Victor Espinosa and also showed hundreds of hands with cell phones in the air, <laughs> taking pictures <laughs> or videos. It, it was an incredible moment that showed how we, our great race and, and the tradition of the Triple Crown has moved into another era. And uh, we've had the first, uh, the first hero of the social media age, so I love that. But I also love the way that, as I mentioned earlier, American Pharaoh dealt with people. And there's one great moment. There were a lot of great moments at Churchill Downs. And I'm one of those who was lucky enough to stand next to him in a stall one day, and he's nuzzling on you chewing on you and just, just, just like a baby. Uh, but uh, th there's a, a veterinarian in, uh, in uh, Lexington, uh, near Lexington, at the Haggard Davidson McGee Clinic, Dr. Dr. William McGee. And he's 85 years old. He's, I believe, America's oldest practicing equine veterinarian. And in his incredible career, he had had his hands on seven of the previous 11 Triple Crown winners, either wow. treating those horses or, or just coming to see them. But, it, but had, had touched and and had been close to 7 of the 11. He wasn't going to miss the 12th. So when American Pharaoh got back to Churchill, he called Baffert, and Bob Baffert said, yeah, come on out. And in the morning he came out, Dr. McGee's in a wheelchair. I mention he's 85. And, um, and Baffert saw him coming, just said, stay right there. I'll bring him out to you. So it was just an incredible moment. Dr. Dr. McGee's there in his wheelchair. Out comes Baffert with the horse, and he brings, brings American Pharaoh right up to the doctor, and they're looking each other in the eye. And then the horse drops his head in Dr. McGee's lap, just like a baby, <laughs> like he had been around him all his life. And it was just a remarkable moment. And Dr. You could, they just sat there for a few minutes, and Dr. Dr. McGee was rubbing on him and bonding with him. And, uh, and, uh, and, and he, said after, he, sa he said afterwards, he said, I've never been around a horse. Now think of that. Here's a gentleman, that, one of the noted equine veterinarians in the world who had his hands on thousands of horses. He said, I've never been, a horse that connect, been around a horse that connected to people like that. I did hear a little, a little more on this story that, that diminishes it just a bit this week. It's still a great story. I talked to uh, Bob Baffert at the Kentucky Derby Museum the other day, and we were talking about that, and he said, he said, yeah, uh, he said, uh, that was a really great day. So I brought him over to Dr. McGee, I said, and, he, and he said, and, and just in case the horse was a little cranky, I threw some carrots in the doctor's lap. So, <laughs> so, was, so again, it takes a little of the romance out of it, but, but, but I like the total moment, the essence of the total moment. So. So, uh, but, and I do remember Bob Baffert's comment after he won the Breeders' Cup Classic at uh, Keeneland, becoming the first horse ever to win the Triple Crown and the Breeders' Cup Classic because the Breeders' Cup Classic did not exist the last time we had a Triple Crown winner in 1978. Baffert was standing there in the winter circle, patting Pharaoh <coughs> on the shoulder, and he looked at his family and friends. He said, we're never going to have another one like this one, which is probably true, but we always dream that we do. <laughs> That's why we're back this spring. 20 horses entered for the 142nd Kentucky Derby, and we have an unbeaten favorite in this year's race. Now, unbeaten favorites don't do that well in the Kentucky Derby. We did have a good one named Smarty Jones a few years ago that won the Derby on one of the rare derbies that uh, almost didn't happen. 
if any of you were there in 2004, you'll recall that we had a little rain shower uh, prior to that Kentucky Derby. Storm came rolling through. We actually had a lake in the infield at one point. Uh, um, we were starting our renovations at one point, and uh, some of our construction crews had been dumping concrete into a hole over there, and they, they couldn't figure out. It just kept going in. They couldn't, uh, turns out it was filling up a sewer over there. So <laughs> one great background story in Derby history. We had a lake in Derby infield because our sewer was clogged with concrete. Uh, so not the most romantic moment you ever want to hear, but it's one that you remember. And actually, we almost lost that derby because part of the racetrack, thanks in part to the concrete, almost uh, washed, uh, did wash out in the first turn. We lost part of the racetrack there, and our crew came together. They got all the new material, got it up there, got the jockeys to take a look at it, and they were fine with it. We ran the derby, and Smarty Jones won, and nobody knew anything happened. So it's taken a lot of things, a lot of work, and a lot of people to keep the streak of Kentucky Derbies at 142 in a row. But again, not many unbeaten horses win the derby. The best-known one, Seattle Slough, 77, won the derby, and then went on to win the Triple Crown, the only unbeaten winner of the Triple Crown. Nyquist is the name of this year's unbeaten favorite. He is, uh, breaks one of my cardinal rules for, uh, for horse racing and the naming of racehorses, and that is, if someone comes to you and says, you know, you're one of my best friends, you've done so much for me, and I have this horse, and I'd like to name this horse after you. And what you should say is, I'm really touched by this, but, but please, please, find somebody else and name the horse after them, because... Horses named after humans are normally two things. Number one, incredibly slow. It almost always happens. Number two, they're incredibly healthy. They have long careers and drag your name through the mud for 10 years. <laughs> this is normally what happens. <laughs> Different this year with Nyquist, who's named after Gustav Nyquist of the Detroit Red Wings. His owner, John Paul Redham, is a big, uh, is a big hockey fan, trained by Doug O'Neill, written by Mario Gutierrez. That's the team that uh, won the Kentucky Derby just a few years back with I'll Have Another. So they're back with this horse, who's perfect in his career. He's a son of Uncle Mo, another, one of those derby favorites that was scratched the morning of the race because of an injury. And so there are three Uncle Mo's in this year's derby field. This is the best one, and, and he's just done everything that's been asked of him. He's had doubters from day one, and all he does is find another way to win. And he comes in here as, as the derby favorite at 3-1, to one, a pretty solid derby favorite at 3-1. to one. And um, again, if he, if he wins it, he, he joins a very short list of, of horses with, uh, with unbeaten records that win the Kentucky Derby. And a lot of folks tend to think this year's strength in the horses is in California. And so the second choice of Mike Battaglia's morning line is a horse named Exaggerator, who is 0 for 3 lifetime against, uh, uh, against uh, Nyquist. And, but uh, when Nyquist left California, he ran in the Santa Anita Derby and, and caught the mud. And that's important because I hear there might be a little rain sneaking into the forecast about 6 p.m. on Saturday. But Exaggerator is a brother act. Jockey Kent DeSormo has won three derbies. His uh, brother Keith is the trainer, and he's never won one, so they're going to try to win one. I know how brothers get along. I suspect if they don't win, they'll be fighting by the eighth pole somewhere there. That's the way it is with my brother. But, uh, but uh, he's, he's a wonderful horse that, uh, again, moves up if it's muddy, so that's one to, to put a circle around. And, again, when, when uh, Nyquist left California, he won the Santa Anita Derby by six and a half lengths in the mud. So a horse to really look at. Trainer Steve Asprison, based at Churchill Downs, he got news last week that he's in Racing's Hall of Fame at the age of 50. And uh, Steve has two horses in this year's Kentucky Derby. One is named Gunrunner. He ran a very good race last fall at Churchill Downs called the Kentucky Jockey Club. It's a race that I believed at that time was the strongest field we'd ever had in that race, which is more than 100 years old. And, uh, and it's proved, uh, proved pretty well. We've got four horses from that race running back in the Kentucky Derby. Gunrunner's one of those. He looks great on the racetrack. And then there's another one from the Asperson Barn named Creator, one of the many grays in this field. If you pick your Kentucky Derby horse by the, the color, and uh, uh, the question I get asked more every year, than, you know, they don't ask who's the two-year-old champion, who's going to get a mile and a quarter. The question I get most often in the spring is who is the gray horse? People love betting on gray horses. This year, they're going to have to bring extra money because we have four gray horses in the Kentucky Derby. And if one scratches and another one draws in, we could have five, which has got to be somewhere close to a record. Creator's a really cool guy, really good-looking gray horse. And he, he did, it took him six races for him to finally win. Uh, but now he's won two of his last three. was just an easy winner of a, what I believe is a sneaky good, very important prep for the Derby, the Arkansas Derby. And I think the Asterson's horses are both ready to run. Another great horse I think could run spectacularly well in this derby is a horse named Mohe Men. He's owned by the Shadwell Stable. That's the folks from Dubai who have been trying for more than 20 years to win the Kentucky Derby. I, I have no idea how many millions of dollars they have pumped into trying to win the Kentucky Derby. I do know one year they bought one horse for $25 million and one horse for slightly less, and they were both in the barn in New York on Derby Day. 
their return on investment after 20 years of pursuing the Kentucky Derby is zero. Their best finish has been sixth, and uh, we don't pay the sixth. We only pay the four. So, uh, so they're here with this horse, who's uh, trained by one of my favorite people in the business. Mo Hey Men is, uh, is trained by a guy named Kieran McLaughlin from Lexington. Uh, a great trainer. He's won many great races. He's one of the former D. Wayne Lucas disciples. D. Wayne, of course, has won four derbies. And, and Kieran's trying for his first. Kieran got so close in 2005. Any of you remember a horse named Giacomo that won the Kentucky Derby in 2005? 50 to one shot that got there. The horse that was second that day that not as many people remember is Closing Argument, who was 75 to one and was trained by Kieran McLaughlin, who after the race, I saw him not far after the race, he said, man, I almost won the Derby. And then he went, man, I almost won the Derby, because <laughs> you don't know if you're ever going to get that shot again. But he's here with a horse that might, had he not run against Nyquist last time out, uh, might have been the Derby favorite. He was the favorite through the spring. He, sa he was beaten by Nyquist in the Florida Derby. Finished a dull fourth that day. Some of it might have been Nyquist, I think. I think the rest of it, is, it just wasn't his day. I don't think he liked that racetrack, but he's a wonderful horse. And Kieran McLaughlin is one of my biggest heroes in thoroughbred racing, not just because of his success on the track, but because of success in his life. Because a few years back, he was a you know, hard-working trainer, gets up every morning, and he's there with the horses 24 hours a day if he needs to be, and he gets a doctor's diagnosis that he's suffering from multiple sclerosis. And it has not slowed him down. He sticks to a... Uh, his, uh, his uh, medication regimen. He's at the racetrack every morning. He works hard to raise money for MS causes. And he's just one of the great people in thoroughbred racing. And sometimes you bet on the best story. And for me, the best story this year is, uh, is Kieran McLaughlin and, uh, and, uh, and Mo Hey Man. I, I do think you go about seven or eight deep with these horses when you're looking for the favorites. Bob Baffert, uh, you'd think he'd had enough, but no, he's back for another derby. He now has four derby wins, a triple crown under his belt. And I think he's got a major player this year in a horse named Moore Spirit. The uh, Moore is spelled M-O-R, so it's spelled just badly enough to look good on our wall at Churchill Downs if he wins the Derby. Horses never finished worse than second, came to Kentucky last fall, ran in that race I told you about, the Kentucky Jockey Club, finished second, although he ran kind of out of type that year. And he's ridden by the great Gary Stevens, Hall of Fame jockey, who is now 53 years old. If he wins it, he will not be the oldest jockey to win the Kentucky Derby. Bill Shoemaker holds that honor, but he's right there, and he should be an inspiration to many of us in this room. Gary retired a few years ago because of injury and decided he had to come back. He's ridden spectacularly well, but to tack a fourth derby on at 53 would be a, be a pretty remarkable thing and something to cheer for. Uh, Tom Fletcher, uh, our top trainer in America, uh, he's got a room full of Eclipse Awards as champion trainer. Two horses in this year's Kentucky Derby. One is another gray horse named Destin, who won the Tampa Bay Derby last time out, but he, he raced on May, March 2nd. That was his last race. It's going to be more than two months since his last race. And uh, I think that's asking a lot, but Todd's a great trainer, so if he does it, we'll have 12 horses in here with two months between starts. That's what happens when you see one win. Everybody jumps in there. I, I do know one thing about uh, this horse, that, and I don't know the, the owner, but I do know one, as uh, many of you know, I'm a Western Kentucky Hilltopper. I do, do, uh, do, do wave the red towel, and one of, one of their owners is a Western grad. I don't know who he is, but he better have a red towel swinging in that winter circle if, if, if they win. If they, win, uh, if they win with this horse. And Dr. Capaluto, it's wonderful to have you here. And, but I always must point out, that I, as much as I regard, have high regard for the University of Kentucky, I believe the University of Kentucky is in Bowling Green. But that's just me. <laughs> that's just me. And then the other horse from uh, Todd Fletcher's barn's horse named Outwork. Remember I told you about Uncle Mo, the derby favorite who scratched on the morning of the race? One of his babies, and he's owned by the owner of Uncle Mo. Who, and and I, I tried to throw this house, horse out all spring long. And he won the Wood Memorial in New York uh, last time out in a, in a big performance, and he's looked great over this racetrack. Hard for me to uh, to ignore him at this point. Then there's a Louisville, a Louisville, strong Louisville connection horse, and it's amazing. You look back in the history of the Kentucky Derby, and you know here it's been for for 142 years, but not that many Louisville residents have owned a winner, or ridden a winner, or trained a winner. We've got a chance for a Louisville native and Dale Romans to win the Kentucky Derby this year with with Brody's Cause. Now, Dale grew up on the racetrack. I'm guaranteeing you, his, his, the earliest memory of his childhood involves the Twin Spires. His father was a trainer. He spent all his formative years out there. Father never dreamed about the Kentucky Derby. He was more about, uh, about uh, cheaper horses. He didn't want the pressure of training big horses. But uh, Dale wanted it right out of the box. And he's uh, trained some terrific horses, won a Freakness a few years ago, and now he's trying for his first Kentucky Derby. He believes it's his best opportunity and he's been smiling for two weeks. That's a, that's a good sign at this time of year. You know smiles, actual smiles, and then Derby Week smiles. We know things aren't going that good, but we're going to go ahead and try anyway. This horse is doing spectacularly well and, and could give uh, Dale Romans, who would become one of those rare little billions, 
uh, to to win the Kentucky Derby. After that, we got lots of lots of big shots. Uh, uh, I think it's a year that we can have a favorite win, like Nyquist. Not going to be surprised by that. Also, not going to be surprised if we get a 30 or 40 to one shot. A lot of talented horses in there. If you like long shots, I will, I will mention two or three here. And, and I want you to be careful and write down every horse that I mentioned today because the one that I do not mention or the ones that I do not mention, the winner will come from that group. That's part <laughs> of the, that's part of the humbling uh, part of horse racing. Uh, but a couple of long shots, I think, have wonderful shots, uh, wonderful opportunities to win. Uh, my man, Sam, uh, he's, he's trained by a, guy, a young gentleman named Chad Brown. Um, he's a horse that uh, hasn't won a major race yet, but he was a flying second from a bad post position at Keeneland in the bluegrass. And, I just thought it was a really good effort. He's run well here. Uh, Brown also has another horse named Shagath, which is also owned by the folks from, from Dubai. And he's doing well here, too, after running poorly in the mud in the Wood Memorial last time out. But my man Sam's the one I like from that group. Uh, I mentioned earlier the Arkansas Derby. I thought that was a really good race, and Creator won that. The second horse in that is a horse named Sudden Breaking News. Sudden Breaking News is one of those long names with an all crammed together. Racing's rule is you can have 18 characters for a name. Use as many words as you want and as spaces if you want, as long as 18 characters fits the bill. Uh, sudden breaking news takes up every letter, so it's one of those all jammed together uh, numbers. He's trained by a guy named Donnie Von Hemmel, who may be the best thoroughbred racing trainer you've never heard of. You'll know him on Derby Day. He'll be the guy in the cowboy hat, and everybody around him will be wearing a cowboy hat. But uh, this horse is coming in exceptionally well. I loved his last race. He's doing greatly here. And, um, and uh, he, I think he's got a big shot, and I think he'll be 30, 35 to 1. And then there's a horse named Whitmore, who was trained by uh, a gentleman here at Churchill Downs, a guy named Ron Moquette, and Whitmore uh, coming off a third in the Arkansas Derby. And I, I, I think he's got a shot to run well. He was 15 to 1 when he won his first start at Churchill last fall. He'll be a good bit higher <laughs> if he wins the Kentucky Derby, but not without opportunities. So those are some long shots. Let me, let me mention a special horse in this field, because we're always looking for something in Derby history. We talked about the unbeaten angle with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Nyquist and and all the gray horses, uh, but, uh, but we have, a, and one of those gray horses is a horse named Lonnie. Now Lonnie, if nothing else, wins the frequent flyer a mile award for this year's Derby field. He is based in Japan. He flew to Dubai, won a $2 million race there called the UAE Derby, then came straight to Kentucky. So he's traveled a long way to get here. We've never had a horse from, J Dubai, from uh, Japan win the Kentucky Derby. In fact, we've only had one that ran in the race. And the same jockey is gonna be on this horse, Yutaka Take, one of the best jockeys in, in Japan. But what is most notable, Horse has talent. He's, again, by Tappet, one of our top sires. And, uh, but, but there are some unusual things about him. First of all, the Japanese train much differently than American trainers. This horse goes out in the morning. He might spend 45 minutes or an hour on the racetrack. Every time you look up, he's coming around. You think, how long can this guy keep standing? So I don't know how fast he's going to be, but he's going to be fit on Kentucky Derby Day. He's going to be able to go a mile and a quarter, probably several times. I just don't know how fast. <laughs> The other thing that's exciting about him is, is Justin, I don't know in polite company exactly how to describe this to you, but, but let's just say that, that this horse, of all the horses I've seen in derby history, it's my 20th derby at Churchill Downs, my 34th overall, and I've never seen a horse quite like Lonnie who is, who's so excited about his work. Let's just say when he's on the racetrack in the morning and his training, he visibly shows you <laughs> that this is one of the most incredible moments that you could possibly imagine. He's out there. It's a physical sign. Um, maybe it's a filly that walks by. I don't know. Maybe it's just high on life. But I'm telling you, I've seen him go by, and I've seen men applaud. I've seen <laughs> women and children avert their eyes. Um, he's been much calmer this week. But I will tell you, our photographer, if you go back on our website and see any of the, the photos of Lonnie from a week ago, our photographer earned his keep because he airbrushed him very carefully on several mornings to make him uh, PG rated for the, uh, the Derby crowd out there. And I don't know what's going to happen on Derby Day. Uh, he's a very skittish horse. Uh, you know, he tried to work him a couple days. He wanted to work him six furlongs one day. He went one furlong. And he said, I'm done. I'm done. But he just shut down and walked off the track. So he does kind of what he wants to. He's very nervous going to the starting gate. If I were the, uh, the most nervous people on Kentucky Derby Day, it will not be the people with the favorites, not the people with the first time starters. It'll be the horses on either side of Lonnie, because you're not sure what he's going to do coming out of the gate. He's a nutcase going in the gate, but he seems to settle when he's in there and comes out okay. But he's very distinctly, he's a personality. And I, and, and I would hope that if he should win the Kentucky Derby, be a momentous upset, one of the great stories in Kentucky Derby history, he would be a wonderful racehorse, but I hope he would go right to the farm, because he is uniquely qualified for his next career. <laughs> and uh, just, just... I don't know that anything's going to happen. I'm just saying be ready for anything on Kentucky Derby Day. 
I've advised our folks at Vineyard Vines to see if they can get some advertising space just in case, but they have they, they, they not got to get back to me. But, but Lonnie is a, he, he makes this derby exciting. You never know how the horse is going to react to it. Again, go back to American Pharaoh last year and the unflappable super athlete and how he came to pieces on Derby Day. Still found a way to get it done. A lot of good horses didn't do that. Uh, you look back over the years, the great Damascus, one of the best horses of the 20th century, uh, pretty badly beaten third in the Derby. There, uh, point given for Bob Baffert. Point given with Bob Baffert was uh, um, a huge favorite. I thought he was good enough to be a Triple Crown winner, but picked Derby Day to run his poorest race. Came back, won the Preakness easily, won the Belmont by 10, but you never get a Derby Day back. Now, Baffert's horse this week is more spirit, who ran in our race last fall at Churchill Downs. Again, he's never run worse than second. He did have a, does have a couple of things going against him now, and I, I, I don't know that this is really valid, but in the post draw yesterday, he drew post number 17. No horse in the history of the Kentucky Derby has won the race out of post 17. It's the only Ofer spot in the starting gate in the Kentucky Derby. And again, that's, there have only been about 30, 35 out of 142 years break from there, but still, you know, some, some, somewhat significant. It's also the gate that Point Given broke through <laughs> in his 2001 Kentucky Derby. So Bob has not had much luck out here, but I believe he's a major player in the Derby. And one, one, two more horses I'll mention real quickly are owned by Tom Benson of the New Orleans Saints. The owner of the Saints is here. Uh, his coach is here with him for the Derby, and I suspect a good chunk of the city of New Orleans has come to visit. A horse named Mo Tom, another Uncle Mo. Trouble-plagued colt, but he could get lucky on Derby Day, somehow get his way through the 20th horse field. And if he ever gets a shot to run his best race, He'll be tough. And he's got another one named Tom's Reddy, who's trained by Dallas Stewart, a Kentucky-based trainer, also from New Orleans. But Dallas is most notable for being, A, a uh, former assistant to D. Wayne Lucas, but B, twice in the last four years, he has saddled a 35-to-1 shot to finish second in the Kentucky Derby. And uh, people, when they see Dallas come to town, now this horse is going to be in that neighborhood, although, it's, although I suspect because of what Dallas does, has done on Derby Day, a lot of people are going to bet on him. They shouldn't be betting on him, but... Uh, but he's, uh, one of these days he's going to win this thing, but he's had extraordinary luck at long prices, and everybody's going to throw him in the, uh, in the trifecta. So it is a fascinating group. A lot of horses, 20. We've got two on the also eligible list looking to get in and, and sorting those out as a chore. I will mention the Kentucky Oaks, which, frankly, three weeks ago looked like an easy win for a horse named Songbird, who's an unbeaten champion, incredibly beautiful horse, who came down with a fever about three weeks out. There's a lot, a, a lot of ways to lose a race and then not even to get there. It's nothing that's going to hold her back long term, but it was just enough. She would have missed too much to feel good about going into the Oaks with, and, uh, and so she's missing the race. In fact, I think she would have been the derby favorite had she run in there. She's that good. So there was going to be a field of about seven, eight for the Oaks when she was in there. Now we've got overflow 14, and the, uh, the favorite is a filly named, uh, uh, named uh, Rachel's Valentina. She's the daughter of Rachel Alexandra, who won the, if you were there for the Kentucky Oaks in 2009, you saw her uh, win the Kentucky Oaks by 20 and a quarter lengths. She went on to beat the boys in the Preakness, becoming the first female to beat the boys in that race since the early part of the 20th century, and went on to be the horse of the year. This is her last baby. She's only had two, because she, uh, you know, it's amazing how pedigree works, but her mother was a horse named Lotta Kim, who had a lot of trouble in childbirth. She only produced two fillies in, in, her, in her career, and, and Rachel was, was one of them. And just... It, it was just dangerous to her health. And the same thing with Rachel. She's had extraordinary struggles with two babies, so this is the last one. It'll be romantic if, if she gets there. A couple of other fillies I'll throw at you. A horse named Lewis Bay is doing spectacularly well, uh, trained by, I mentioned Chad uh, Brown earlier, and she's a, she's a filly that, uh, that I think is coming to the race perfectly. She's worked well on the track. And Steve Asmussen, the new Hall of Famer, has got three fillies in the race, and, uh, and I think his best filly is a gray filly, oddly enough, with a weekend theme named uh, Royal Obsession. She's got a big chance to win. And then the hunch bet of all hunch bets. If you guys have paid attention in the last month, you may know this filly's name, but there's a filly in the Kentucky Oaks trained by Rusty Arnold, who's a, a uh, third-generation horseman. He's never won the Oaks of the Derby. Got a big chance here. She won the Ashland at Keeneland a few weeks back. And her name is Weep No More, which, of course, comes from a familiar song. Now, I know it's the Derby song and not the Oaks song, but if you don't Bet week no more in the Kentucky Derby, at least $2. There's nothing I can say that could ever help you here. I mean, <laughs> the, the Lord is telling you that at least you got to take a shot with this filly named after a line from my old Kentucky home. But Lewis Bay and Royal Obsession are the horses I like in there for the Derby. Again, it's a tough group. Uh, the, uh, the favorite, unbeaten as he is, taken on every challenge, done everything you wanted to do. He looks great on our racetrack, and that's not good enough for me. So I'm going to try to beat him. My, my, my one 
bit of faith in trying to beat him. And he said, I believe that a mile and a quarter distance might be a problem for him. As what great trainer once said as he, you know, about his horse, a guy named Bob Holt, that's a late trainer from here at Churchill Downs. He said, when his horses came to the Derby, he'd say, you know, I think he likes the first mile and an eighth the best. <laughs> and that next eighth of a mile can be a little bit of trouble. But, and I, I think distance might be a problem, but he's a brave and a very good horse. And, and, but I'm going to try to beat him. And uh, Mohe Man at 10 to 1 in the morning line, I think, is the horse for me. He's going to be close. Not a great amount of speed in this race. So I think you're going to see just a few horses up there. They're not going to be going really fast. One thing, our point system is done. It's eliminated a lot of fast sprinters in the race. So... So uh, I think he'll be close. A horse named Danzing Candy will be on the lead. And if they let him go in 48 seconds for the first half mile, I'm going to tear up all my tickets and throw them away because he's a horse that could lead wire to wire. Uh, but I don't think he'll get that opportunity. So I like him. I love the Bob Baffert horse, more spirit. He's lost two in a row coming in. That doesn't matter. You just need to win the one on the first Saturday in May. He's already shown he loves our racetrack. And I think the Baffert Stevens positive karma is a, is a big thing. So I think he's a... He's a, he's a great shot to win, as is Gunrunner. I think Steve Asterson could very easily win the Derby with either of his horses. Gunrunner's the one I like the best. And then for the long shot, as I mentioned earlier, my man Sam, who ought to be about 30 to 1, and, and I'm uh, hoping to see him closing down the home stretch on Derby Day. Don't know how we're going to top next year's Derby, last year's Derby. Don't know that we can. Again, looking back to American Pharaoh, that record attendance, the perfect weather. Uh, a lot of great days in the history of the Kentucky Derby. That was one of the better ones, but... Uh, I know whatever happens this year, it's, it's, it's going to be good. It's Derby Day. We're going to see some marvelous athletes perform out there. We're going to see a lot of things on the racetrack. We're going to enjoy food and fashion and, and uh, just have a lot of fun. And then uh, we will toast the winner, whoever that may be. And then we'll come back in a year and, and, and do it all again and wait for those moments and sing along with my old Kentucky home and cry. And then, and then, uh, and then, then cheer another winner in the winner's circle as they, they win the roses. You know, the purse, the winner of this year's Derby gets $1.6 I still guarantee you they'd show up for the roses and the trophy. It's, it's just that special over 142 years. I hope all of you have a wonderful Kentucky Derby. Uh, I'm going to revel just a while longer in my spectacular one-year winning streak and see if we can stretch that out a little bit. But it, it, is, it is fantastic to be here. I really appreciate it. Again, the sight sounds derby. There's so many things like, like American Pharaoh did. There's things you just don't expect to see. So, for instance, like the president's suit here. I mean, I love the president's suit, but what I'm most impressed with is that you found a tie to match. That Thank you. This is a marvelous, marvelous <laughs> thing. But spirit of Derby, and uh, we're all we're all soaking it in right now. So, have a great one. Thank you again for having me. John here. Asher, thank Happy you so Derby. much. Stay up there. I mean, it's past one o'clock, but if you got a couple a couple minutes for questions, leave to go to the track. I did have one question. All right. Uh, the weather's going to change on Saturday, so it's going to rain. I heard a forecast today that uh, from a friend of the National Weather Service said it might roll in about 6 o'clock. Any mutters? Of course, Derby post time is about 6.40. I would say uh, Exaggerator would be the most notable. He's already run great in the mud, but but the horses that ran in our race last fall, specifically um, uh, More Spirit, Baffert's More Spirit, and Gunrunner both handle it well. And right. have handled our track well. Okay. Any questions, anybody? Because I think everybody wants to get the track. Yep. John Asher, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Happy Derby. Everybody